we turn to our scripture reading today, which is from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 24 is the passage at which we'll be considering today. And if you have your bulletin, uh, the back of the bulletin is where you will find the outline of today's sermon. <clears throat> we are in the last book of Ephesians, and not just the last book, but also the last few verses. We have been working through the book of Ephesians week by week, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It has taken us several months to go through this book, despite it only being six chapters. And now we have come towards the end. It's a little bittersweet, but at the same time, those who have been with us I'm sure, just as I have been, we have been greatly edified and greatly enriched by the Word of God. So we come now to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 24, and that is the passage that we will be considering today. Hear now the Word of the Living God, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may, may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose that you may know our affairs, and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. This is the word of God. We come to this passage Ephesians chapter 6, covering verse, seven, uh, covering verse 18 to verse 24. And the title of today's sermon is Praying for Preachers. Before we jump into the gist of the message today, I want to take a step back and have an overview because we have really come to the last passage in the book of Ephesians. We have spent so many months going verse by verse, covering so much detail and so much rich doctrine. How can we not forget from chapter 1, where God had chosen us before the foundation of the world? C.H. Spurgeon said, God surely chose me before I was born because he definitely wouldn't choose me after I was born. And that is the truth that was actually shown to us in Ephesians chapter 1. Remember that this letter was written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was actually in prison when he wrote this letter. He was writing to the Christians in Ephesus. It was the church there that he actually helped Plant. He founded that church when he was there with them. He lived there with them for about three years. And now he was arrested and he's in prison and he's writing to fellow believers there in Ephesus. Last week, we learned concerning the Christian warfare. We are currently engaged in a spiritual warfare. Everything that happens to us in the physical realm 
actually has a spiritual counterpart. There is actually a spiritual struggle between Satan and all his wicked agents against Christ and all of the expansion of his kingdom. There is that tension that is going on. Our enemies are not those that are just directly in front of us, even though there are times when you just feel so frustrated about one person or one situation. But the struggle is actually spiritual. It's more than that. And in order for us to stand, in order, in order for us to be victorious, we must put on the whole armor of God. And what is that whole armor of God? We covered that last week. There are five pieces. The first, it's the belt or the girdle of truth. Then the second is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness has to be put on. And then the sandals or the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. And then fourthly, there is the shield of faith. Remember, it's the faith. It's something that could be well-defined. It's not something that is ambiguous. And finally, the helmet of salvation. These five pieces of the armor of God is what we have to put on. Don't leave out any single part of it. We have been told to put on the whole armor of God that has been emphasized again and again. You see that in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. And then again in verse 13, take up the whole armor of God. Don't just put on one piece and not the other. It will help us to stand and we will not be defeated. But don't just put on the defensive armor of God. God also have give us, given us offensive weapons. And what are the offensive weapons that we actually saw last week? The first is the spiritual sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the second is prayer. Those are the two offensive weapons that God has given us that was covered in verse 17 and 18. We have the two weapons of the Word of God and prayer. The Word of God must be used in order to fend off the enemy. You remember when Satan tempted Christ? When Satan tempted Christ, he tried to quote scripture to Christ. But what did the Lord do? He used scripture in return. He used the living Word of God to fend off Satan. The Word of God, therefore, must be preached so that the stronghold of Satan will be torn down, so that souls will be captured, so that souls will be won. And we have been given a great commission that we must preach the gospel of Christ and Him crucified so that the kingdom of God may extend. Then we are given the weapon of prayer. Prayer is like summoning of spiritual power from God. It is the invisible part of the weapon that God has equipped us with. His power comes to us through the hidden channel of prayer. So when a person preaches the gospel, he must also be prayerful about it. You must preach the word of God and you must pray. That way you will be invincible. God has already promised that when you put on the whole armor of defense and when you use the two weapons of offense, namely the word of God and prayer, you will never be defeated. Instead, you will be used by God to extend his kingdom. Every Christian needs to put on the armor of God. Every Christian needs to pick up the sword of the Spirit and prayer. If every Christian uses these weapons, what more the minister of God, the one who is actually preaching God's word, those who are called to ministry, 
uh, so those are the frontline battle soldiers. Those are the ones who are actually fighting at the front line. The ministers are those that are fighting at the front line. They need the support of other Christians in prayer while they themselves are also using the sword and prayer at the same time. Those who actually spend full time in preaching and in prayer, they will be helped by others who pray Pray for them. And that is the message of today. This passage gives us three truths that are all related to one another. The first truth is that every preacher needs the prayer of other Christians. And three reasons may be adduced from this passage. If you were to look at verse 18, it says that praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then in verse 19, and for me. Paul is asking the Christians in Ephesus to pray for him. You see that there is a continuity there. All Christians need to pray, but pray specifically for those who are laboring in the ministry. Just as Paul was asking the Ephesians, pray for me. We also ought to pray for the preachers of God who are laboring, who are fighting on the forefront of this spiritual battle. Pray for the laborers of God. In 1 Timothy 5.17, it says, Give double honor to all elders, especially the one who labors in word and doctrine. So we have to pray for the laborers of God. What is it that we should be praying for? What is it about the minister that we should be praying for him? In verse 19, it says, That utterance may be given to me. Paul, the apostle, is asking fellow Christians to pray for him such that he will have the utterance, that he will actually have the words given to a preacher. And what else did he also ask for other than the words and utterance? He also asked for boldness that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul, he's probably one of the most well-educated Pharisees out there at that time. But yet, he's still asking fellow Christians, pray for me, pray that I will have the words to say, the utterance, and pray that I will have boldness. And from all these, he says there in verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So from all these, we can actually draw out what Paul is trying to say to us. What are the lessons that Paul is trying to tell us here? Firstly, a preacher is unable to save anyone except to carry out his duty of preaching. Remember what Paul has already said to us earlier in this letter. In Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of you have prayed a prayer or you have walked up to an aisle and you have accepted Christ or you have said something that made God want to accept you. No. You are saved simply because God freely gives you salvation. That is grace. He freely gives it to you, not because you deserve it, but because He loves you. He loves you before the even foundation of the world, before the, before the world was even formed. He knew that you will be born. If we were to be earning our own way to heaven, 
we will never be able to accomplish it. Try. Try your best. Try to be a perfect person. Tell me if you know of anyone who's perfect. I have several young children. I never need to teach them how to lie. They know how to lie. I never teach them how to steal. They know how to steal. That's because their sinful nature is just as such. We are all sinners. And because we are sinners, God is a fair, perfect, and holy God. He has to judge us. If He doesn't judge us, He's no longer fair. Imagine a judge, an earthly judge, who says, Oh, you murder one person? Okay, I forgive you. You murder two persons? Okay, I forgive you. You murder ten persons? Okay, I forgive you. Is that a fair judge? No. That judge just couldn't care less anymore. Similarly, if God is a fair judge, He has to judge. If He is just, perfect, and holy, He has to judge us for our sins. So our sins need to be paid for. And how is that paid for? It is by Christ. Christ Jesus, His Son, was sent to die on the cross to pay for the sins of His people. And that His righteousness may be counted as ours. And that is how we are accepted by God. Not because of any good in us, not because of any merit in us, but because of what Christ has done on the cross. Christ and Him crucified. The gift is given to you freely. What do you need to do when there is a gift that is given to you freely? You need to stretch out your arms. And those arms are the arms of repentance and faith to receive that gift, that free gift that was given to you that you don't deserve of. So repent and believe. That is why we say salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. There is no other way by which we can be saved. Salvation is truly the work of God. But you then ask, how does a Christian come to faith then? It is through the hearing of the gospel. The gospel has to be preached so that people can hear. And when they hear, they can then have faith in Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by hearing. Someone has to hear the gospel before they can have faith. And hearing by the word of God. You remember what the sword of the Spirit is? It is the Word of God. We have to use the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit as we engage in this battle of spiritual warfare. Yes, God is going to save. It is by grace through faith in Christ alone. God will call out His chosen people by the preaching of the gospel. But who is it that preaches? Who is it that takes the word to everyone? It's not just the preacher. It is every single one of us. The great commission, the great mandate is given to the church, is given to all of us. All of us have a duty to share the gospel with those who are still outside his kingdom. But the preacher, the preacher is specially ordained, sent out, he is as though he's at the forefront. He is the one who is actually going to be actively sharing the gospel. His role is really to preach. To preach the gospel of Christ and Him crucified. And the Apostle Paul here in the book of Ephesians, he is conscious of that fact. He knows that he preaches and people are saved not because of anything good in him. It's not because of his ability to persuade people. It's not because he's depending on his wisdom and his own human ability to win souls for Christ. No. Salvation is truly of the Lord. Our duty, the preacher's duty, is to share the gospel. 
to share the gospel boldly and faithfully. Those of us who have been doing outreach at MIT, there is some fear. All of us have some fear when we actually go up to some stranger and start sharing the gospel. You have to get over it. But when you share the gospel, the comfort that we have is knowing that it's not because of our ingenuity or our ability that someone will be saved. Your job is just to share the gospel. And Christ has actually promised that his word will not return unto him void. So share the gospel. Share it boldly. It is not us who wins souls to Christ, but it is Christ who does it all. The Spirit of God will work in the hearts of people when they hear the gospel. It will move them that they will break down their heart of stone. A person can be very persuasive, but yet what is being produced is not true conversion. It can be just emotional at that moment. It could be something that is out of the action of a person or the will of the person, but there is no thorough change inside that person. I actually met someone just this past week, and I was sharing the gospel with him. It was my son. He was having a rock climbing class, and a fellow parent, I was just talking to him. And I started sharing, saying that, yeah, I'm part of this church plant, uh, and started sharing the gospel with him. And his response was that, Oh yeah, I've all done that already. I walked up to the front of the stage. I've accepted Christ. Uh, I've done the altar call. I've said the prayer. So I'm good. But I realized that nothing changed in me. Nothing really changed after many years. So I realized that it's just a bunch of baloney. Oh, my dear friends. What the apostle here wants is for disciples for Christ. He's not just wanting you to actually have a temporary emotional peak where you're actually raising your hand, where you're saying that, oh, I'm being anointed or anything like that. But he wants genuine, true conversion where you actually see the need of your sins and repenting and trusting in Christ alone. We don't want people to claim that they are Christians when they are actually not. We want them to be true disciples of Christ and the Holy Spirit must change them from within. You must be born again of the Spirit. And the way the Holy Spirit changes a person from within is through the hearing of God's Word. So God's inspired Word has to be shared with people. The Apostle Paul is conscious that for this change to come about, the Holy Spirit must do a mighty work with the preach word that goes out. The word of God must be preached so that the Holy Spirit uses it to convert people. The Apostle Paul knows that it is not him who saves people. He is merely a vessel of God to share the gospel. But he wants to be an active vessel, a well-used vessel, a well-used channel for the truth of God so that the Holy Spirit can transform the hearers. That is why he asked the fellow Christians in Ephesus, pray for me. What exactly was he asking the prayer for? Again, it says there in verse 19, for utterance, for the ability to speak in a certain way such that it is an effect active channel of the word to the hearers. This is different from mere eloquence. You know, there are some people that are really gifted with a silver tongue. They can really give an impromptu speech and it will be very well taught out, very, very well organized, very well laid out and everyone who hears it, they're just convinced of it. They have a very good command of their language. But Paul is not interested in mere eloquence. He want, what he wants here is the unction of the Holy Spirit. He actually wants the word to be conveyed across 
to be used by the Holy Spirit in the quietness of people's hearts to bring about conviction of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. That is what the Apostle Paul wants. It has nothing to do with how smooth your speech is. No, it has nothing to do with drama. It has nothing to do with anything mere oratory. When a preacher is anointed by the Holy Spirit, his words come across effective in convicting people of their sins. That is what the apostle wants here. Utterance. Words that are owned by the Holy Spirit. Paul is asking that we pray for that in preachers. So I ask you, my friends, have you been praying for preachers? Have you been praying that God's word will go forth clearly such that it will convict people of their sins, that they will turn from their sins and trust in Christ? If you have not, this message here today is speaking to you, my dear friends. Pray for preachers. And the preacher really doesn't know what's going on in your mind. I don't know what's going on in your mind right now. I don't know which side of the bed you get out of today. I don't know what happened to you before you drove here today. Each of us have our own thoughts, our own trials, our own burdens. Maybe you're thinking about something else. Maybe you're troubled about something else. But somehow, through hearing the word of God being preached, God's word somehow addresses your need. God's word somehow comes across like a wave and it overwhelms you. It speaks to you in a way that you just can't put your finger on. You are pricked of the word that is being heard. You know that God is speaking to you, even though it's a mere human saying those words, but it is God's word. That is what Paul is talking about here. Pray for preachers that the words may be given to them to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Because without that, there will be no conversions. Conversions, salvation, is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Secondly, Preachers are inclined to minimize the word of God because of the suffering for the faith. Sufferings come in very different forms. Preachers are, sub are subjected and they will always be exposed to all kinds of suffering. Some have to die for their faith. Some have to give up the comfort of their life to labor for God. Some actually have to go live in the jungle so that they can actually minister to that population of people at which they have been called to minister to. Some even have to suffer through onslaught character assassination where people blatantly and openly call them names and tell lies about them. Some have to go through severe trials. And remember the Apostle Paul himself he is writing this from prison. He was arrested for preaching the gospel. And in verse 20, it says, I am an ambassador in chains. And when that happens, so often it is that the preacher is tempted to water down the message, to compromise their stand in order to be treated more kindly. How often it is that we actually see this great temptation to relieve the suffering that the preacher may be going through, to just give in a little bit so that we can actually have a little bit more comfortable life. And Paul is asking here, pray. Pray for boldness. Pray for boldness to continue preaching the true gospel. You remember Martin Luther? the great reformer, he was persecuted from every front. His life was in danger. 
And one thing that he made sure of was that he would never succumb to the fear of men. Satan has a very powerful weapon, and that is fear. Any one of us who have actually shared the gospel with someone, tell me you have never feared. You're lying if you actually say that. Of course we fear. We fear that our friends will shun us. We fear that our relatives will think that we are just crazy. We fear men. We fear our colleagues. We fear. And often it is, if you are rattled, if you have been frightened once, you may be afraid to preach boldly after that. Satan will have accomplished his purpose. Luther did not want that to happen. He wanted to continue preaching boldly in the midst of persecution. And Satan also often combines fear with discouragement. He uses discouragement to make us preach less, to share the gospel less. The fear of man and discouragement makes us want to preach less. So pray, my dear friends, pray for the preachers. The preachers need prayer because that is that great temptation to reduce the suffering that they may be going through, the fear of man, the fear of discouragement. Thirdly, the preacher may be tempted to compromise the message. Paul says there here in verse 20 that he is an ambassador in chains. He is an ambassador of Christ who is currently in chains. Soon, the Apostle Paul will be tried by Caesar. But Paul is reminded that he is serving King Jesus who is greater than Caesar. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is basically a representative. And to be an ambassador of Christ, you are sent forth by Christ himself. You have his authority. You must therefore boldly carry out your duty as an ambassador of Christ. Not just to preach boldly, but also the message the message that the king has entrusted you to deliver has to be delivered accurately. You want to be an effective channel of the gospel even before Caesar. If possible, let Caesar bow his knee to Christ. If possible, through that one opportunity that you may have to share the gospel of Christ and Him crucified, to share that sermon, to convict Him of His sins, that He would turn to Christ for mercy. Oh, my dear friends, we recently actually had Pastor Jaikan from Sri Lanka sharing a report to us on the work in Sri Lanka. Many of you don't know, there was actually civil war going on and there was actually the Tamil Tigers that tried to kidnap his daughter. He had to flee for his life. And there was once where he was commanded and he was called out by the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. He had to go through to the jungle. Three days he traveled just to meet the leader of the Tamil rebels. And when he got there, he preached the gospel of Christ. It was the opportunity that he actually had. And guess what? God uses things in different ways. That leader, that Tamil Tiger leader, says, Pastor, I know you. You prayed for me when I was in hospital. I didn't know you at that time. God uses different ways to accomplish his purpose. And Paul here, not wanting to compromise his message in any way, simply because he was going to face Caesar. Therefore, he asked, pray for me, pray for boldness. And again in verse 20, pray for boldness to face the rulers and kings. The apostle is suffering in chains, and he is again about to be called out by Caesar. But yet he says there, that I may declare the gospel boldly as I ought to speak. 
how many of us can actually do that? But should we not do that? All of us have to declare the gospel boldly as we ought to. Today, not many of us actually have to face kings. But we have to be prepared to serve King Jesus in the same way. He might actually send you to preach to someone else that you don't know. You may actually preach to the poor and to the rich. You may preach to the lowly educated or the highly educated. We all have to be prepared to preach the gospel of Christ and Him crucified, regardless of what walk of life that we may be in. Some of you may know the missionary Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson, interesting enough, was actually from here, Walter, uh, uh, Malden. He was born in Malden. He was a great missionary to Burma. He was a native of Massachusetts. He knew that in order to preach the gospel freely in Burma, he had to see the king of Burma. So he went to see the king of Burma. That journey wasn't an easy one, but he made the effort to go see the king of Burma. Adoniram Judson knew that he was serving King Jesus. He did not fear a human king. Read his biography if you have not done so already. It's truly an inspiring one. He suffered much for Christ. and He's a native of here, our neighbor, Malden. Pray for preachers that they will not compromise the gospel of Christ. Pray that they will not fear man. Look at the churches today, my dear friends. So often it is that churches actually measure success by the numbers. The more people that come, the more successful you are as a preacher. And in order to attract people, you water down the message. You water down what is being taught. You actually start compromising on the truth that is encapsulated here in the pages of Scripture. They would preach things that people would like to hear. That God is love. God is good. All the positive things, but they would not preach sin. That you need to repent of your sin. And Christ is the only Savior. That God's wrath is like about to pour forth on you. Oh, how often do we actually hear all the good news on, this, on, the, on, the, on the TV screen? It makes us feel good. But is that truly the gospel of Christ and Him crucified? Often it is that we don't want, preachers don't want to offend people. And they don't want to offend especially the rich folks in the congregation because they are the ones who are actually paying and tithing. They are paying their salary, right? So they, they, they water it down. They try to compromise and they try to make it sound better. People try to threaten to leave so you water down the message? No, Paul would never do that. Even though not all of us have to preach to kings, we have this additional pressure of wanting to please people. Therefore, pray for preachers. Pray that their message will not be watered down simply because of the desire to please others. There are at least three reasons why every preacher needs, to, needs the prayer of others. Those three reasons which are given. They must preach. They must pray. If they preach without prayer, it's never going to work. But they will be helped very much if other fellow Christians pray for them. But who should pray? Who is it that should be praying for the preachers? That leads us to the second point. Every Christian needs to pray for preachers of the gospel. In verse 19, Paul had to remind the Christians to pray for him as he preached the gospel. Why is this reminder necessary? One reason is that all too often, Christians 
think that their contribution to the gospel is through their finances. If I have contributed something, if I have put money into the offering box, if I have done this or done that, I have done my part. Oh, my dear friends, have you forgotten that God looks at the heart? God does not need your money to further his kingdom. What is more important is the heart. The heart in the ministry. You must pray for the gospel to be successfully preached, to take effect and grip the souls of people. If you really want to see God's kingdom expand, you will have to pray. Don't just think that putting a few dollars in there, here and there, oh, you've done your part. Remember that when you were first saved, when you were first converted, when you were first a Christian, you wanted to see the kingdom of God expand. You wanted to pray. You wanted to share the gospel with others. You had a burden for souls. You invited people to church to hear the gospel being preached. But how often it is that we actually grow cold. We begin to be caught up with the many things of life. And however legitimate those issues or those reasons may be, if they are actually drawing you away, drawing you away from your commitment to God, Oh, friends, you have gone astray. People give excuses. Oh, I have exams. Oh, I've got a new house I need to actually take care of. Oh, I've got a newborn baby. I can't go to church anymore. Oh, I've got a new job. There's always going to be endless excuses. But can you not pray? Pray, my dear friends, pray for those who are at the forefront of the battle. And that is what Paul is asking here. Pray for your pastor. Pray for ministers that they may preach the gospel without fear and favor of men. Can you not do that? That is why we need to be reminded that it is not just financial contributions. Our heart has to be in what we are doing. God wants your heart. All Christians need to pray for preachers, not just giving financially and thinking that you're good. Now, how do we pray? How may we actually pray for preachers effectively? The apostle shows us two things. First, you must pray with perseverance and supplication. In verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So pray consistently with perseverance. Don't just pray once and say you're done. Pray regularly for the preachers. Pray for them. Every person that... that that every person that they speak to, every gospel message that is being shared will work in the hearts of the unbelievers. Pray for those of us who go out and do outreach at the MIT campus, that God's word will speak to the hearts of many, that they will be broken inside and to only cling to the cross of Calvary for their salvation. Pray in supplication. You are coming before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Pray earnestly and pray humbly to your Father in heaven. Secondly, pray specifically for the preacher. And how do you pray specifically for the preacher? And I'm running out of time. I have to speed up here. You have to be informed of the preacher and his ministry. How do you actually pray for the preacher if you don't know anything about the preacher? If you don't have any information to pray for, what do you actually pray for? You have to know the circumstances that, that he is in. You have to know the battles that he's currently fighting. You have to know the trials that he's undergo, undergoing. You have to know the family needs. You have to know the church needs in order for you to be praying effectively. 
And that is why the Apostle Paul says here he sent Tychicus, a brother in Christ, a fellow servant in the ministry. You see there in verse 21, that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you. Paul was not content just to write his letter that Tychicus is just going to read out to them. No, there are a lot of things that couldn't be said here in this letter that Paul wrote. The details have to be filled in. Tychicus was going to be there in person. He was going to deliver this letter. He was going to read out this letter to the church in Ephesus so that they can actually ask him questions, so that they can actually be informed of the ministry of Paul. We, here in the Greater Boston Reform Baptist Fellowship, have had the privilege of having people from all over the world sharing their ministry with us here. We have had the privilege of knowing the work in Shreveport, Louisiana, to know of the work in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to know of the work in Myanmar, in Nepal, the work in Sri Lanka, and the monthly newsletter that is being sent out. You know what's going on there. All the updates have been provided of the struggles and the progress that Christ and his kingdom has been making. Why do we do that? It is so that we can pray for them. Pray, my dear friends. All Christians should have an interest in the ministry of a preacher. We need to know, otherwise how are we going to support him in effective prayer? When Paul sent Tychicus, and he actually specifically mentioned that, that Tychicus was specifically sent for this purpose. Look at verse 22, it says, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, that you may know our affairs. We must come to realize that we fail if we do not find out more about the preacher and their ministry. The same applies to us as a local body of believers. How are we to pray for each other if we don't know each other? As a body of Christ, we are called to bear each other's burdens, to pray for each other. But yet, if we don't know each other, how are we supposed to pray for each other? Oh, don't blame the fact that, oh, I don't have the opportunity. Oh, I don't have enough time. The opportunities are there, my dear friends. We have lunch every Sunday together. We have fellowship meals there every other month at the preacher's house. We have email updates going out every month. But yet, have you not shown any interest in the mission work that is going on, not just here, but beyond? We are supposed to be in this spiritual battle together. And if you really cannot fight on the front line, at least support the preachers by praying. And in order to support them, you must know them as persons. You must know their circumstances. You must know their ministries. How do you pray for your preacher? How much do you pray for the missionaries that are actually stated in the newsletters that are being sent out? This is where the word of God comes to you today. I fear some of us here that you are already being drawn astray. You are no more pilgrims and strangers in this world. You are caught up too much in the worldly affairs of this world. You always have a legitimate reason for not wanting to come and hear God's word being expounded. We need to take heed. God is good to us. He wants to bless us. What he can bless us is only what you are willing to do. He does not want to force you. He does not want to pull you by the ear and drag you into his kingdom. We ought to willingly submit to him and pray with perseverance and supplication. The Apostle Paul then continues by saying, when Tychicus is there, you must come and listen to him, not only to find out more about Paul and the affairs, 
but also to be comforted by him. When Tychicus comes, he's going to be talking about the kingdom of God, what God has been doing in the gospel advancement in the household of Caesar. And we learn all that in the book of Acts. You are going to hear spiritual things and be comforted. And is that not the case for those of us who have actually heard the missionary updates? We have been ministered to when we actually hear of Christ and his kingdom magnified in Sri Lanka. When you don't hear God's word, you will decline spiritually. When you spiritually decline, how can you actually have an interest in God's missions? And that is the big problem. Often it is that people don't come for meetings and therefore they are not being ministered to. And without being ministered to, their spiritual life declines. They can claim that they are making up by reading, reading up themselves, but that is not the same, my dear friends. You are actually disobeying God by not gathering together regularly. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Do not neglect the assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another instead, and all the more as you see the day is drawing near. Just think. This letter to the Ephesians, do you know how many sermons we have had just in this book? 19. 19 sermons we have covered this book. How many have you missed? If you have been absent for various reasons, then how are you being ministered to? God wants to pour forth his blessing on us, but we are not there to receive his blessings. Don't forget that God sees through our hearts. If you are serious, then understand this. You are required to pray for the preachers of the gospel in order for you to see the kingdom of God advance. We need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're not praying, then do something about it. And finally, all Christians need the strength and the blessings of God. We are told there in verse 23, Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us have peace among the brethren. What does that actually mean? Peace. To the brethren, can we not have peace among fellow believers? We have been loved by God. Let us show forth our love for our Lord by loving the brethren, by loving his church. We are having the same spiritual father. We call out to him as our father in heaven, Abba, Father, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Are we not able to live in peace? And as to the worldwide church at large, the question is, what are you doing to the advancement of the worldwide church? Have you prayed for the advancement of the kingdom of God? Look at the mission field before us. Just look at our backyard here in the greater Boston area. There are so many people who have yet to hear the gospel of Christ and Him crucified. What is your contribution? How much have you prayed for the advancement of God's kingdom here in the Boston area? Oh friends, we are fighting a spiritual war. Have you been praying about the advancement of God's kingdom here in Boston? We need to respond to God's call. And in verse 24, he says, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. If you have a pure love for our Lord, not one that is colored with personal gain, then may such grace be upon you. We are not the only Christians that are around. 
There are others who love the Lord just as much as we do, or even more so than we do. We may not agree on every theological issue, but as long as they are believers in the Lord, we need to rejoice. The kingdom of God is expanding there. The gospel is being preached there. We should rejoice together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, should we not come to the Lord with our knees bowed? Should we not shed tears of repentance before him? For not being consistent in our Christian faith. For not being consistent in our prayer life. Our life on this earth is so short. Let us serve our Lord who died on the cross for our sins. The Lord means well to us. He does not deal with us as we deserve. The teaching of the Bible is meant to build us up in faith. But the benefits of that will only come if we respond to his admonition. So as we close, ask yourself, do you pray for preachers? How is your spiritual life? Do you cultivate peace and love with your faith? If you do, then may the grace of God be upon you. May his grace be upon all of us here today.